questions wherever you are, welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody, to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. I hope everybody's having a phenomenal summer so far. I know me and my family did some RV trips. It is now raining here on the Kenai Peninsula, but that's a good thing. My lawn's going to be green, so I approve of that. Um, school's coming right back around the corner. Parents are gearing up, getting everything ready for their kids to go back to school. If you listen, watch, and read Must Read Alaska, and you want to help keep the lights on, just go to mustrealaska.com. On the right-hand side, there's a little donate button. Every $5, $10, $100 helps keep the lights on here at Must Read Alaska. If you want to sponsor the Must Read Alaska show, just email me, John, J-O-H-N, at mustreadalaska.com. We have a very special guest today, Some somebody who's returned. I think you might have the, the most amount of returning episodes ever. Rick Whitbeck, the director of Power of the Future of Alaska. Welcome back to the Must Read Alaska show. Always great to be here, John. I, I appreciate the fact that uh, I may hold the record. I may not, but uh, let's keep it going because I enjoy coming on. So it's always uh, always a blessing to be on. Yeah, so I ended up here too in, in Anchorage. And, uh, you know, after the last couple of weeks, I had a vacation and glorious weather on the Kenai Peninsula. Rain is necessary. I mean, we had, I think, one day of it while I was on vacay. Got some color on this bald dome of mine and uh now <laughs> i get to go out and have rain pour off at the top of it so it's always good to be back on the show appreciate it that's awesome so tell people first just remind folks of of who you are and what you do i think it's a very important role here in alaska what do you get to do here in alaska well so power of the future was started to be a voice for energy workers across the country right i mean so many decisions are made in the power centers of of dc and on the coast with little regard for the actual locations, communities, and people that those power centers forget about, right? So let's shut down fossil fuels. Well, fossil fuels aren't created in Washington. I mean, the policy is created in Washington, D.C. Coal is mined in Wyoming and, and Alaska and West Virginia. Oil is pumped in you know Alaska and, and New Mexico and places that most of these policymakers have never, ever stepped foot in. They've never been to a mine site. They couldn't spell, you know, uh, rig if you spot them the R and the G. So, <laughs> but they're making policy that affects tens of millions of Americans, um, you know, directly and indirectly from jobs. And then they impact every American in their pocketbook, in energy costs, in inflationary uh, tactics, and in administrative burden. And so Power of the Future is a voice for energy uh, sanity. We fight for workers, we fight for um, opportunities, we fight for projects, and we push back on this whole narrative that traditional energy in, in, all, of its, uh, in all of its forms is bad for America, it's bad for consumers, it's bad for the planet, it's bad for the climate. It, that's all bunk. And so we, uh, we as aggressively as we can, um, change the narrative and, and add a voice to the energy conversation that wasn't there before Power of the Future came around. That's awesome. So let's talk. Uh, let's talk about Cook Inlet Energy because I think that that's you know I live here on the Kenai Peninsula, out here in Nikiski, where you know there's lots of those kinds of things happening. I think yep. you know we've we've uh, since Walker even before then we've been hopeful to, for a potential big project. You know what's your take on what's going on in the Cook Inlet? Uh, give us kind of an update from your perspective, and if you're hopeful for the future. Well, I, I'm hopeful for the future because we need this solution to come sooner rather than later, right? I mean, the, let's first of all say this. There's not a shortage of Cook Inlet natural gas. There's decades of natural gas under the under the crust of the, uh, of the earth. Um, there's a political will shortage amongst lawmakers and policymakers to figure out a way to get that gas to market. Now, you have Hillcorp who's doing everything that they can. And I and I want to just give a shout out to Hillcorp. They are producing 90 plus percent of the gas out of Cook Inlet right now. They're doing everything they can. They're going to go explore for, for new wells this year. They've got a jacked up rig there. Um, then you have Hex Fury, you know, with John Hendricks and, and his crew ready to go and start pumping gas into the market. But they've got a, a, a royalty issue and they've got some, 
some burdensome costs that the legislature could have addressed and chose not to in the waning days of session. Um, then you have Benji and the people at Bluecrest um, who really just need financing. And in today's political economy, with the climate cult saying that every drop of oil and every you know um, cubic foot of natural gas is pulled out of the uh, of the planet is creating a climate crisis. Well, it's harder to get financing. So there's a political will missing, and as a result, you're going to have some short term pain. I think um, from imported LNG. Uh, I think that Instar is moving ahead with that because they need certainty in their contracts. I don't blame them. But from a regulatory cost standpoint and from a and from a consumer cost standpoint, I'm certainly not looking forward to 20, 30, 40 percent higher bills um, as their as their cost of of supply goes up. Um, you know, we have trillions, hundreds of trillions of cubic feet of natural gas up on the North Slope, John. And if we could ever get a gas pipeline, a KLNG project, a bullet line, we could we could serve the rail belt from Fairbanks to Homer um, and all locations in between for over a hundred years, well over a hundred years and give us export opportunities as well. Again, that's a political will uh, meeting uh, financial reality. It's a $50 billion project. Banks don't want to lend in the Arctic because of the climate crisis. And so, you know, there, there has to be a meeting in the minds because right now, there, again, there's not a cook inlet energy shortage as much as there's a cook inlet supply crunch due to policy issues that could be addressed and should be addressed and should be addressed today rather than tomorrow. And, you know, when you say policy issues for the, for the folks listening in, is this folks policy issues from a federal standpoint, from a state standpoint, both kind of all. kind of what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, all. Certainly the federal government's not doing any anybody any help. I mean, whether it's the Biden administration canceling leases in Cook Inlet, which therefore allow uh, doesn't allow for a, additional exploration to, um, you know, the legislature not taking up a, a bill that could have helped spur and incentivize Cook Inlet actual energy production, gas production, um, to, you know, to the courts um, siding with the environmental left and, you know, the radical environmental movement that doesn't want to see any more oil pumped out of the ground. I mean, you have this combination of federal and state and judicial um, decisions and, and stymies that are impacting consumers and they're impacting businesses. And every energy underpins everything. I talk about it all the time, right? Whether it's on your podcast, on, on, articles and must read on my show, on anything. Energy underpins everything. Without affordable, reliable energy, your cost of transportation goes up, your cost of supply goes up, your actual utilities go up, your um, you know, your day-to-day -day costs go up. And th that affects your pocketbook. So it leads to, you know, decreased um decreased uh, monies that you could go have uh, discretionary spend on. If you don't have money to go to the movies or don't have money to go to the, you know, go get ice cream because you're spending it on energy costs. Well, then that's a problem because then the money doesn't flow through the economy and small businesses get hurt. Who doesn't get hurt? The people who are pushing the, you know, ideology that, 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 uh, that energy production is bad. Again, why power of the future exists to push back on that stupid narrative. Yeah. And it's funny. It's, you know, I, I often think about you know, the uh, celebrities who are all about climate change, who take their private jets to the, you know, G8 meeting or something like that. You know, these people that come up with these ridiculous policies or support these policies, they don't mind if they use the the gas. They just don't want us yeah. using it. <laughs> John Kerry's John Kerry is probably the biggest hypocrite out, out there, right? Well, the only way for me to do my job is to fly private and I offset with carbon credits. Come on, John. Like, you want me to eat bugs and you're going to go fly, you know, to, to Davos <laughs> on your private jet, just because you can afford to offset the, the, the social cost of carbon. Well, tell you what, when you give up that and you start eating bugs for, you know, stuff, instead of um, your wife's Heinz ketchup on top of your filet mignon, um, then I'll start actually caring what you say. So what about, you know, I've had some guests on the last couple months who, 
have said, and I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, Alaska needs to move to green energy. We need to be, you know, the majority of our energy needs to come from green energy solutions. What do you, what's your take on that? You first. Um, how about this? When <laughs> when we were when we were um, in the midst of the coldest part of this last winter, the last week of January in Anchorage. I know I know it was thirty below down there on the peninsula for a couple of days. We hit 25, 30 below here in Anchorage, and it was 40, 45 below in parts of the valley up north. And between the Eklutna Dam providing about 10% instead of its normal six, and um, Hillcorp draining some of its reserves with the natural gas production, um, that's what kept South Central Alaska and the Kenai Peninsula with its lights on and its heat pumping. Let me tell you exactly how many houses were helped by the huge green project called uh, the Fire Island Wind, 700. 700 homes in Anchorage were powered for that week on average, it was like 680 to 730 per day because of this massive 11 you know, uh, turbine farm out on Fire Island. How many were helped by the huge solar array out in Willow? Zippo, not one because it, like 13 below, according to Tony Izzo out at, at uh, Matt Nuska Electric, and like 13 below, they have to shut it down because it actually costs more energy to keep the solar array working than the solar array is actually producing at that temperature. So 700 homes would have been powered. Nothing would have been heated without uh, the Eklutna Dam, which did about 28,000 uh, homes and businesses. And the rest of everybody, including all their heat, from Homer to Willow were powered by natural gas that day. So tell you what, when, um, you know, Reap and all these uh, eco guys come on your show or anywhere else and start talking about, we can get to 80% renewables, you first. When you live off the grid, when you do away with, you know, your computers and when you uh, help establish domestic supplies of strategic and critical minerals rather than selling out to China, then I'll start listening to you. Otherwise you're playing in an adult world with a bunch of crayons and coloring books. Yeah, I think some of this is nice, fancy headlines. I, I, I listened to an interview with um, the Secretary of Transportation uh, and Biden administration, and, and the, the uh, CNN host asked him, you know, you have all this money. I think it was like, I don't know, $4 billion to put up these electrical uh, hot spots where people can plug in their electrical cars yeah. all over the federal grid and you've had three years and you put up six yeah seven <laughs> yeah. now by the way seven yeah, it's officially <laughs> seven thank Which, you mayor pete for your leadership on that important important issue i mean that's so god awful it's hilarious but it's just like so sad at the same time that's what we're faced with fancy headlines lots of potential green money, but seven stations put up. <laughs> if, in, in the Inflation it's, Creation Act misnamed the Inflation Reduction Act, 396 billion with a B to drive green infrastructure. It's grift, it's absolute grift. You're going to see Solyndra on a massive scale. And then what happens when somebody rational like President Trump comes back in office and says, whoa, we're spending $400 billion to do nothing, truly not change a thing when it comes to the climate, when it comes to solving the crisis. And I'm using air quotes around that for those listening to the podcast, um, you know, who, who aren't making any significant changes to the atmosphere because the U.S. has such a small percentage of global emissions compared to the Chinas and the Indias of the world that we're not going to make the difference that the climate cult wants you to make. And John, all you're doing is handing out, like I said, hundreds of billions of dollars to your friends and buddies to create solutions. And I'm saying solutions again in air quotes, right? That aren't going to drive any change, but it's going to make everybody feel good. And it's going to, you know, bring kumbaya moments. And it's going to bring donors back to those Democrats uh, campaign funds and campaign coffers. So hell, let's just do it because that makes everybody, you know, win in the end, right? Because the more Democrats that can get elected, the better 
climate policy will will be. It's it's a self-perpetuating race to the bottom for the U.S. as we, and I say we, um, as a country, try to adapt and adopt to a decarbonized world. Number one, it can't happen. So number two, it's not. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Everybody just probably saw or will see today that Kamala Harris picked her VP. Um, what's your take on how good or bad the Biden administration has been so far for Alaska? And what do you think, uh, you know, four more years of this is going to do for Alaska if they get re if Kamala gets elected? Well, so so let's first of all talk about the 66 and counting administrative or executive orders that the Biden-Harris administration has, has whammied Alaska with. And for those of you who don't believe me on this number, go to Senator Sullivan's website at sullivan.senate.gov. Mm -hmm. Right on the front page is the last frontier lockup. You can go to the link. And it's 66 times that the Biden administration has targeted Alaska for anti-development, anti-resource-based opportunities that have shut down part of our, parts of our economy. 66 times since taking office January 20th, 2021. Um, and counting, by the way, that number continues to go up every uh, once every couple of weeks. They update that. So, first of all, the, the Biden Harris administration has been abominable for Alaska's uh, economy, for our jobs, for our opportunities, and for our energy future. The Harris Waltz administration could be even worse because where Joe Biden talks about being middle class Joe and you know a friend of. Uh, you know, from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and understands the oil and gas industry, even though he's tried to shut it down and promised that he would end fossil fuels on the campaign trail back in 2020. And he's tried like hell to do that. John, he's not the cultist that Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz are. Tim Waltz, lockstep with Gavin Newsom in the state of Minnesota, um, has signed decarbonization plans that want to take uh, Minnesotans from 1% of EV use to 20 by 2035, wants to take them to net neutral, carbon neutral by 2040. I mean, if that's not a sign of idiocy, I don't know what is. When he was in Congress, he signed cap and trade agreements. He signed um, legislation as the governor to impose mandates on uh, getting rid of traditional energy. And then in one of the biggest faux pas, and I'm not going to say, I mean, in one of the worst decisions that he has made as governor, but this is, shows his ideological bent, when the Biden-Harris administration canceled the Twin Metals mine permits up in Northeast uh, Minnesota, which was a huge, almost pebble-level copper, nickel, cobalt uh, deposit, they had permits, and the Biden administration canceled them. Rather than fight for the 2,200, 2,300 jobs that would have been directly and indirectly impacted, rather than fight for his green energy supply chain, rather than fight for the people of Minnesota, he capitulated and said, yeah, you know, we'll get it elsewhere because we can't mess with the uh, ecosystem up there. Let's contrast that with Dunleavy, right? And Pebble. Biden-Harris administration does the exact same thing with Pebble. And, and you know, Mike, to his credit, has fought like the Dickens to uh, try to change that in the courts. You know, we're suing the federal government over the EPA's decision to to uh, preemptively shut down Pebble. Whether or not you agree with me on Pebble, and I'm one of the biggest advocates of the state who doesn't work for Pebble, um, it's a world-class deposit of something that the green advocates say is needed. And why would we continue to empower China with this green technologically, uh, you know, green technology in the supply chain when we know that they have nothing but our worst interests at heart? Tim, Tim Walls capitulated. Mike Dunleavy fights. Harris Waltz is uh, could be ten times worse ideologically than Harris Biden or Biden Harris or Obama v two or whatever you want to call it. Right? Uh, Harris Waltz would be horrible for Alaska. So let's say former President Trump wins. How how um, how quickly do you think he can unravel things that Biden? wound up in a ball for Alaska? Well, I mean, administrative and executive orders can be overturned by administrative and executive orders, right? I mean, we saw that with with um, with the way that that Biden just came in and, and undid a lot of the Trump era policies that had been done by, you know, the EPA and Interior and things like that. 
but really I think what, what has happened is I think you're going to see the courts start to unravel more and more of those in conjunction with good sound policy by Trump. We saw this with the Supreme Court, the Chevron decision, John, um, where the courts basically said, whoa, 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 Congress creates laws, the executive branch administers those laws, the judiciary makes sure that they're legal. Let's go back to what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so I think that the Trump administration, when they take over in January 2025, should just go back to the courts and say, was this legal? Nope. OK, get rid of it. Was this legal? Nope. Get rid of it. Was this legal? Nope. Get rid of it. Was this legal? Nope. Get rid of it. Rather than playing the, you know, I'm going to override your executive order with the new executive order, you just look back to the courts and say, did this meet the, you know, did this meet the administrative overreach that Chevron is supposed is designed, you know, that decision is designed to kill and and let the courts overrule. Now, the, the problem is that you have a whole bunch of entrenched career bureaucrats that have an ideological, ecological bent you know, that are placed in there under the Obama and even the Clinton administration who are still working that hate everything that, you know, traditional energy provides for America. So until you get rid of some of those people, and again, those are 20, 30 year employees, uh, it's going to be hard to enact those really quickly. But again, a, a Trump Vance administration has four years, and I would hope that they would put good people in key positions and start to un... Uh, untangle the mess that that the Biden Harris administration will have left America and especially Alaska in. So, um, thirty minutes here has gone by in a flash. Last question to you is this: Are you hopeful for Alaska, uh, and why? Yes or no? Oh yeah, I'm always hopeful for Alaska. We have so much opportunity, John. I mean, think about this: whether you're up on the North Slope or down on the on the Panhandle, um, Alaska is blessed by God with just tremendous resource opportunities. It's not just oil and natural gas. It's, you know, critical and strategic minerals. It's gold, it's copper, it's um, it's fish, it's timber, uh, it's coal. We have so much opportunity. We just need an opportunity to unlock it and we need an opportunity to develop it safely and, and responsibly and do what we've done for decades, um, steward the lands with an environmental uh, understanding, but use those to to drive America and Alaska forward. I'm super bullish on on uh, what could happen as long as we get good sound policymakers at the federal and state levels and local. But uh, you know, if we get it, if we go back to what should be happening federally with Chevron in our back pocket, with um, a good administrative state, uh, I'm super excited for what happens in the next you know couple of decades here in Alaska. Nice. Well, Rick, I really appreciate you joining us here on the Always. show. Welcome back anytime. Um, folks, if you just caught the tail end of this, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to the whole thing. Rick Whitbeck, the uh, director of Power of the Future Alaska. I'll put all the links in the podcast description so you can go check out his website and Twitter and his show as well. Um, for folks that listen, watch and read Mustry Alaska, if you want to help keep the lights on, just go to mustrealaska.com on the right hand side. There's a little donate button. Every $5, $10, $100 helps keep the lights on here at Must Read Alaska. If you want to sponsor the Must Read Alaska show, the number one podcast in Alaska, just email me, John Chen at mustreadalaska.com. We'd love to have you sponsor the show. Everybody enjoy your summer. And until next time, I'm John Quick from somewhere in Alaska. Thanks, Rick.